This is the foundational story of the Old Testament. And even if you are not religious by any stretch, you probably know the story of Moses. There have been a number of very well-made movies, really since they've been making movies, they've been making movies about the Exodus. And until you get to the gospel in the New Testament, this was the story of God's redemption. When the, they got together to celebrate and remember what God had done, this was the story. That, of course, is of Moses leading the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But that's only the first part. It's not even the first half of the book of Exodus. Then they arrive at Mount Sinai where they're given the law and there's the episode with the golden calf. And then there's a long stretch about them building the tabernacle and establishing the worship of the Lord in that tabernacle, the beginnings of the law. So we're going to see a major transition as we go through Exodus. The first half or so is going to be a lot of stories, a lot of narrative, and then it's going to shift and we're going to have a lot of legal language that we're going to work through about how Israel was to conduct not only its worship, but also its civil life, which will prepare us very well for the book of Leviticus and, and then the first part of Numbers as well. And the book of Exodus is not the beginning but it's a beginning of the story that God is telling. The book of Genesis was the beginning of the world and the, and the individual patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Joseph. But starting here in Exodus, we are going to be dealing with the nation of Israel. This was the key moment in the launch of God's plan to redeem all the nations by choosing a nation of his own. He says, I'm going to have my people and my people will be used to save the whole world. And we'll get into it other times, but God with his people, you could say, is the theme of Exodus. That God is real, that God, he is, God is there, and that he's going to fight for his people. And in fact, the dramatic climax at the end of the book of Exodus is the possibility that God might not stay with his people. And only Moses' intercession is going to save them. So I'm very excited to get into this. It's going to be very familiar, most of it, but it's no less powerful for all that. Now, as we always do at the beginning of a new book, we've got to frame the background of the book. Why? I know we always want to jump in and we want to look at the, how does it apply to me? This is great stuff, but I didn't go to school for that and I've got to get back to my job. So give me, give me a nugget I can carry with the rest of the day. Well, we're going to do some of that, but here's the thing. You cannot properly interpret and understand any of the books of the Bible without understanding some background issues about them. And most of these, almost all of these, you don't have to go to school for them. You just need to read your Bible a lot. And there are some great godly people that have done some external work that helps us understand it a little better. But I want to get into these issues because it will affect how we discuss and interpret the book moving forward. Beginning with the authorship of the book of Exodus itself. Who wrote the book of Exodus? And we got into this a little bit with Genesis because the Torah, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible are generally assumed to be written by the same author. And that traditionally, of course, was Moses. But the authorship of Exodus in particular has been dissected and eventually discarded with impunity by academics using what they call redaction theory, meaning going back and seeing how the story was edited and changed and sewn together. And they have a tendency to look at the books of the Old Testament especially and Exodus, Genesis, and those in particular as being stitched together from four or so different sources. It's called the documentary hypothesis. It is mostly largely discredited at this point. Like we're starting to see folks move away from that. I say thank God to that. The church really did a good job of holding the line on it. But there are folks that say, it was written, and then it was changed, and then it was changed again, and then it was changed again. Why does that matter? Because folks didn't like what it said, and they wanted it to reflect what they wanted it to say. But let's look at what the book itself actually says. The author was Moses. And it is clear from the book itself, and also from the New Testament, that Moses wrote this. You see it in the book itself. Moses wrote we see it in chapter 17, chapter 24, chapter 34. It continues into the, the rest of it. That Moses was writing things down. That all along the way, God was telling Moses, write this down. So it's right there in the story. We also know from John 5, 46, Jesus said that Moses wrote 
about me. He said it several times, actually. So unless you're going to believe that Jesus was wrong, we ought to believe that this was Moses. Now, as I said with the book of Genesis, this does not mean that Moses could not have perhaps written things at different times and then put them together. It doesn't say that he had to sit and write it from start to finish all at one time. And also some of the things that we're going to see at the end of the, the Pentateuch, for example, the death of Moses, it's kind of odd to think of Moses writing about his own death. So there's no reason to assume that somebody like Joshua couldn't have come behind and finished things off and maybe edited it. He wrote his own book, Joshua. He was an inspired author. So sometimes when folks say, it seems like there might be a seam here. Well, maybe it could, but that doesn't mean that it's not inspired. And it also doesn't mean that Moses wasn't the one that actually put the seam there, so to speak. People hold the Bible to incredibly high standards, and usually they're reading their own theology into it. Something like, Paul wouldn't say that. So who put that in there? Well, how do you know what Paul said? We've only got like 10 letters of what Paul said, you know? It's similar to that with Moses. But there's a quote here from a commentator named Brevard Childs, and he, I don't even think he himself was as conservative in his view of the authorship of Exodus as we are, but I love this quote that he says. He says, It is the final text, the composite narrative in its present shape, which the church, following the lead of the synagogue, accepted as canonical and thus the vehicle of revelation and instruction. So his whole point was, this is the book we have, and this is the book that God sovereignly, sovereignly directed the church to accept. So you don't get to go back and dissect, oh, we only needed this part. It was the book as given that we accepted as canonical and that the Lord delivered to us. Amen. And that seems to be where the trend is going these days. It's like you can cut up into a million pieces. Now it doesn't make any sense. But if you start reading it all as a whole, it's like, oh, it actually is a very well-written book. Who, <laughs> who knew? So that's the authorship. We, we believe it was Moses, even if somebody like Joshua perhaps helped him out. There's no reason to believe that couldn't have happened, but it certainly wasn't written piecemeal over hundreds of years. Of course, we believe that these events took place. I ought to just mention that. This is not just a mythical story that was adapted for the children of Israel. But knowing when this took place is much more difficult. The date of the Exodus is the major question that we have when we come to the story. And before I dive into this, I do want to say that it does not affect the way we interpret or understand the book or any of its theology to know when it happened. But there is, I think, a better way to understand it. So let's go ahead and take a look. There are two major views of the Exodus. You have the early date and the late date. And there are plenty of people that want to have a middle view or like a very early or a very late date. But these are the two main ones. The early date would put it around 1446 B.C., and the late date would have it around 1250 B.C. The early date is the conservative view, and it's also the traditional view. And then the late date is certainly more popular. It's considered the liberal view, although there are many who are theologically conservative that hold to this. So it may be unfair to, to push it into that corner. But it, it relies much more on archaeology to date the book of Exodus than the biblical text itself. It's willing to condense some of the timelines, whereas the, the early date is strict adherence to the biblical timeline. So if, this is, if it says it was this many years, that's how many years it was. It does have some more archaeological difficulties to contend with that should not be quickly dismissed that we're going to talk about here. There are a few markers that, that let us know when it had to have been done by. For example, there's something that was discovered called the Merneptah steel. Merneptah was a pharaoh, a king of Egypt, and he had a steel, which is like a, a pillar that he inscribed something on. And it was talking about how he had defeated Israel in battle, which is significant because it means that by the time this thing was written, Israel was a nation in their land. And that has been dated to 1231 B.C., somewhere around there. Which means by about 1200, 1231 B.C., Israel was indisputably in the promised land. So the Exodus had to happen before that. That's one marker. We also know that Solomon built his temple around 966 B.C., and you say, what does that have to do with the Exodus? Well, in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, it says, In the 480th year after the people of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, 
In the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, he began to build the house of the Lord. So 1 Kings 6, 1 gives us a time stamp. It said, Solomon began to build the temple 480 years after the Exodus. We know when Solomon built the temple. It was around 966 B.C. So you walk back 480 years from that, and you arrive at 1446. That's our early date. We also have another time stamp in Judges chapter 11, verse 26. Jephthah, who is one of the judges, he's talking to a foreign king, and he says, My people have lived in this land for 300 years. Now, if you're working with an early date, the 1446 date, that would put those 300 years around 1100 B.C., which is no problem. If you hold to the late date, and they came in around 1250, 300 years later would be 950 BC, which is after Solomon built the temple. So that can't be right. So if you're just going to look at the biblical data, you're going to arrive at what's called the early date of the book of Exodus. So you probably already know which one I'm going to land on for that reason. But let's take a look at this, because there are godly brothers and sisters in Christ that hold to the late date. And they have some very exciting things on their own side that we perhaps are not able to enjoy as much as they are. They would view the 480 years of 1 Kings 6 as symbolic years because it's 40 years times 12, both very significant numbers in the Bible. And they would see the 480 years not trying to give a chronology, but just trying to express that it's been a long time and it's been a complete work of God in that time. And they would say, what about the 300 years of Jephthah? Well, then they want to look at the rest of Jephthah, Jephthah's life. And he was not Israel's best moment. Let me just put it that way. And they'd say, him saying 300 years, you don't need to take it at face value. He's just boasting to the other guy. It's like saying, we've been here for a million years. You're not trying to be literal. You're just trying to say it's been a long time. So that that's, makes me a little uncomfortable at first because it's like we're going away from what the Bible actually says and we're trying to reinterpret it. Well, the reasons for doing that involve some historical reconstruction. And this is pretty exciting when you look at it, uh, although I don't know that it's convincing. In chapter 1, verse 11 of Exodus, it says that the Israelites built the cities of Pithom and Raamses. So the city of Raamses, which is similar to a name you've heard, Ramesses, in all of the movies that you've seen of the Exodus, the Pharaoh's name is Ramesses. Because Ramesses II was the Pharaoh around 1250 BC. He was known as a great builder. He built cities, he built monuments, and he was one of the few Pharaohs who actually ruled from the land of Goshen, which is where the Israelites lived, if you remember from the book of Genesis. And if Moses is having these frequent conversations with Pharaoh, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, perhaps, for him to travel all the way down to Thebes to have these conversations with Pharaoh. Also, the excavations that have been done in Israel more or less uniformly date the conquest to, of Joshua to around the 1100s BC. Because they say, if we look around the 1100s, there's a lot of destruction and cities laid waste and burn marks down in the, in the lairs. And that would give a lot of support to the idea that the story of Joshua is true and that they actually did come through the promised land. That's one thing that we would have to dismiss if we're going to go with an early date and we're going to have to say this had to have been something else. So however you choose to date the Exodus, you do have some challenges here. It's not a salvation issue, as I said, but I still prefer the early date because, number one, it lines up with the biblical data. And I think if you have, unless you have very, very compelling, like indisputable reasons to take something the Bible presents literally as symbolic, it's best just to go with what the biblical data say, right? I think the history of the time that we're going to look at best explains the scenario of the oppression of Israel. And this is just a principle that I've come to, to believe. Depending your Bible interpretation on archaeology is always dodgy because archaeology is always changing. For example, they used to say Moses could not possibly have written the book of Exodus because writing didn't exist at this point of history. Well, we come to find out writing had existed for a very long time before that. People used to say there was no such people as the Hittites. The Bible made it up until we discovered all these Hittite cities. 
So it's always changing. And if you want to hitch your theological wagon to an archaeological discovery, you're going to be in trouble. For example, there's something called the Amarna tablets around 1400 BC that talk about a lot of trouble Egypt had with some people called the Habiru. Sounds an awful lot like Hebrew, doesn't it? That was pretty much considered slam dunk evidence for a long time, but not so much anymore because it's been dated differently and there are folks that aren't quite sure if it's the same thing. So that kind of slides in and out. So you want to base your conclusions on, this, on the text, not the archaeology, if at all possible. If the archaeology supports it, then wonderful. But especially this far long ago, it's so hard to know anything definitively. And the thing is, archaeologists will say it had to have been around this time. You get another archaeologist to look at it, they might say something totally different. So best to stick with the scripture. Also, I, I, I think this was a guy named uh, Eugene Merrill that, that said this, but he said, if Ramesses was the one that built the city of Ramesses, he, was 40, uh, he reigned for 67 years, and Moses lived for 80 years before he came back to the Exodus. The timeline doesn't quite seem to line up. So perhaps the city was built beforehand and it had a different name. There's all kinds of answers to these questions. I'm going to stop talking about it and just kind of lay it out there. There's, if you want to go look into it, go for it. Use reliable sources, right? Don't just Google stuff. But we're going to stick with an early date for the book of Exodus, for the events of Exodus, I guess I should say, around 1446 B.C., which would make the pharaohs in question men like Amos, Thutmose the third and Amenhotep the second, the 18th dynasty of Egypt. What matters more than exactly when it happened is the fact that it happened. So much scripture hangs on the Exodus, as does actually the very na nation of Israel itself. God is going to refer to himself in the Bible as the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt more than a hundred times. That is how the Lord describes himself. So knowing the story is pretty important for understanding the rest of the Bible, isn't it? The book establishes God's relationship with Israel, not just with a single man, but with the nation. He crashes onto the scene. No one is expecting him. He smacks down Egypt's gods. We're going to have a lot of fun talking about that. It's going to say that he's not just there to judge Pharaoh, he's there to judge Pharaoh's gods, which opens up a whole world of interesting theology, I think. And he rescues his people for a holy purpose and also for a saving purpose. He's saving them so that he can use them to save the rest of the world. Of course, from these people are going to come our Lord Jesus Christ, who's going to save the whole world. And the book of Exodus gives us a typological picture of what God would gonna, was going to do through Jesus. On the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus was manifested in his glory before the apostles and they saw Elijah and Moses talking to him, Luke 9.31 says they were talking to him about his, the English says departure, but the Greek word there is exodus, as if deliberately calling attention to the fact that Jesus paralleled what happened in the book of Exodus. Most importantly, he is the, the sacrificial lamb whose blood covers the door, right? To save us from death. Just wait till we get to the tabernacle. There's all kinds of wonderful symbolism to get into there too. Even tonight, as we go through, there's be a lot of pictures of Jesus that we're going to see. One more common approach to Exodus, before we get into the text itself, is to treat Moses and the children of Israel and Pharaoh as a template for the liberation of oppressed peoples. We've seen this many, many times, especially in the old American South, that it was compared to Egypt there. And they had figures like Harriet Tubman who were called Moses because they were leading the people out of the land, right? And this has continued into modern day through something that is called liberation theology which finds much more to look to in the Exodus than it does in the cross and the empty tomb, which should be a red flag for us at first. But you have various kinds of this, feminist liberation theology, Hispanic liberation theology, black liberation theology, queer liberation theology, talking about homosexuality. Now listen, I believe the Bible should be widely applied. I'm a big stickler for context when we're doing theology, but if we're talking about application, the Bible is deep. 
There's a lot in there that can apply to tons of situations that might not be specifically what the author intended at that time, but is still a legitimate use of it. I believe that the book of Exodus does serve as a moral mandate to show justice and mercy. If you come out of the book of Exodus and you think it's okay to go out and oppress some people, you miss the point. They might say, well, that was Israel and Egypt. It's like, yeah, but there's a bigger lesson there, right? But that being said, I'm going to tell you, you ought to be leery of liberation theology because that teaching defines salvation in terms of earthly success and political victory. That the problem in the world is not sin. The problem is, let's say, poverty or voting rights or the income gap or the patriarchy, or what have you. It takes political issues and reframes them in theological terms. It defines morality in terms of status. If you are a downtrodden person, you are more moral than the person who has trodden you down. And while there can be some truth to that, regular old morality tends to go out the window. It doesn't matter what you do because you're downtrodden, therefore you are excused to do that. What liberation theology misses is that Exodus is not just a story about people getting freed from slavery. It is people being brought from servitude to servitude. They're brought away from serving Pharaoh to serving the Lord. And the one time in Exodus where they decide they're not going to serve the Lord as he has commanded, the Lord is prepared to destroy them just like he destroyed Egypt. What we see there is, is that those who do not keep his commandments will not be spared. God says in Genesis or Exodus 34, 7, I will by no means clear the guilty. And that includes his own people that he just liberated from Egypt. So it's important to get it in context. It is about covenant. It is about being brought out of bondage to Pharaoh and being brought into covenant with the Lord. So if all you're going to focus on is getting liberated, but you're never going to come into a covenant with the Lord, you're not doing theology, whatever it is you are doing. And more than that, it's too narrow a perspective. The Bible shows us that God does not just love the oppressed. He also loves the oppressor. The book of Jonah is about an oppressed person being called to go preach salvation to his oppressors. We miss that sometimes, don't we? That Jonah is all about, I want you to go and deliver the people that have oppressed your nation. And he gets all mad about it. Remember Zacchaeus? Jesus went to go eat at Zacchaeus' house, the tax collector. Everybody got all bent out of shape about it. You know, you're supposed to be here for us, not for them. And Jesus is like, he's a son of Abraham too. Doesn't he deserve the same salvation. And you know what? God is going to be on Israel's team here when they're oppressed. But later on, when they become sinful, he's going to judge them for that too. Does God stop loving Israel when they become powerful? Of course not. He's going to lead them on a rampage throughout the promised land, wiping people out. So what about that? Is there conquest theology? There's not. Being oppressed or an oppressor does not excuse you being loveless. And while Exodus is about temporal salvation from what was done to us, the gospel is about eternal salvation, about what we have done ourselves. Isn't that wonderful how the gospel just expands on that? Exodus is about, I'm going to save you from all that's been done to you. Gospel, Jesus comes in and says, you're the one that was doing the oppressing, but I'm guess, guess what? I'm here to save you too. How wonderful is that? It's why you see uh, people like Ibram Kendi, who has been in the news a lot and writing some books lately, who is a liberation theologian of some stripe. He said that the church needs to get away from savior narratives. It's like, that's kind of all the church has is a savior narrative. Because he's not really concerned with understanding the text as written. He has political goals that he wants to accomplish. And he sees the Bible as a good tool to do that. So those who want to see Exodus as permission to engage in a violent revolution, well, you're out of luck. Because the only thing God tells Israel to do in this story is what? Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. But also those of us who hate any kind of oppression in the world and we want to put a stop to it, you will resonate with the heart of God in the book of Exodus. This is not excuse acting like Egypt Jesus himself said in Luke 4, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me 
to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus is very into doing good things for people that are having a hard time. Very into justice, very into mercy. But to chase those things at the expense of the real problem, which is sin and death, is to make a foolish failure of priority, in my opinion. So tonight we're going to see Israel is going to begin to undergo their terrible oppression in Egypt. We're also going to see their resistance to it, which I think is fascinating because a lot of, a lot of talk these days about how we're going to resist, right? We're going to break the system. We're going to change it. And that can be very admirable. But what we're going to learn tonight is that suffering and subjugation are part of life. There are times for us to be blessed and even times for us to be downtrodden. And there are times where we are to endure what has been brought upon us. New Testament talks an awful lot about enduring injustice, like Jesus endured it on the cross. There are also times to resist. But here's the lesson from tonight. How we fight back is as important as the results we might gain. You might say, well, we're going to tear down this evil structure. But if you commit a whole bunch of evil in the process, the Lord's not going to be pleased with that. In the end, it is God himself who fights for us. Our liberation is God's responsibility, not our own. I wanted to address that because it's very hard to talk about the book of Exodus without that coming up. So I wanted to kind of head it off at the pass a little bit. We're going to talk a lot about justice and mercy. Even tonight, some of the stuff I'm going to say is going to make you uncomfortable. So that's good. But it's about salvation. It's about deliverance at the hand of God, not I'm going to step in and get ahead of God and do things my way. So let's open the book of Exodus, and we'll begin our verse-by-verse -verse study right now. We're going to do the first chapter tonight, beginning with the first seven verses. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. These are the names. That's Ve'ele Shemot in Hebrew. And that actually is the Hebrew title of the book of Exodus. They tend to name their books based on what the first word or so is. So you'll hear it referred to by a Jew perhaps as the book Shemot, which means names. We use the Greek title, which is exodas. Ex means out of. Odas means way or going. So the going out. That's a good title, I think, for this book because that's what it's all about. We miss this in the English translation, but the first word of the book of Exodus in Hebrew is and. It's a continuation. It's intended to connect us back to the book of Genesis that we've reached maybe season two, so to speak, but we're telling the same story. It's a continuation. And we've already read what we've just covered here in verse 7, verses 1 through 7. Joseph became the second in command of Egypt. He brought his family to Goshen to save them from the famine. It was a glorious end to the book of Genesis. Now the first generation of those 70 sons have passed away, including Joseph. So everybody we knew from the last book is gone. Time marches on. And one of the last things we saw in the book of Genesis was from Genesis 50, the words of Joseph. Joseph said to his brothers in these verses, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. So the last thing we saw in Genesis was Joseph expecting that someday these people are going to come out of Egypt, and he's promise, making them promise that you'll take me with you. Don't leave me here in Exodus, in Egypt. Probably going to do that more than once. 
don't leave me here in Egypt. Take me back to the promised land. This is what God had promised Abraham would happen. When God made the covenant with Abraham in Genesis 15, verses 13 through 16, the Lord said to Abraham, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. God told Abraham, right now it's just you, but I'm going to multiply you and multiply your descendants. They're going to end up in a land that is not there. They're going to be oppressed there for more than 400 years, but I'm going to bring them back. And we answered this question at the time, but it's a good reminder now. Why did God wait so long? He said, because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. He says, they do not deserve what is going to happen in the book of Joshua. It's the mercy of God at work. We're going to have to remember that when we start the book of Joshua, because many people want to cast moral aspersions on the Lord there. But what we're seeing here is the fulfillment of what God had said. They are in Egypt. They have become a mighty nation, as God had promised Jacob in Genesis 46. But the last thing we saw in Genesis was the hope of returning to the promised land. And now they've become a mighty nation. Numbers chapter 1, verse 46 is going to tell us that there were 603, 550 men of fighting age that came out of the Exodus. That's not counting their wives. It's not counting their children or their servants. It's a lot of people, millions of people. We now truly have for the first time what might be called the nation of Israel. Israel was just a guy in the book of Genesis. Now we have 12 tribes. And they're living in a place called Goshen, which is in ancient Egypt. We've talked about this. This is the north of Egypt, up by what's called the Nile Delta. The Nile River flows northward. And then as it gets closer to the Mediterranean Sea, it spreads out in a triangle-type shape. And there's all these tributaries that go down to the sea. That's called the Nile Delta. It's the most fertile part of the land of Egypt, as you can imagine, because it irrigates more land. Up in the northeast of Goshen, or of Egypt is where Goshen is. And that's where the children of Israel had settled. And they've multiplied. And in verse 7, it uses words that remind us of Genesis chapter 1, where he says they were fruitful and they multiplied. And it doesn't say it in the ESV, but you could translate one of those words, they swarmed, like fish swarm in the oceans, or as locusts are going to swarm over Egypt later. There's a lot of them. They're not just 70 people anymore. And that's going to become a problem for them, even as they're being blessed. Look at verse 8 now, and we'll read down to verse 14. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Raamses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves, and made their lives bitter with hard service, in mortar and brick, and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. So there's a new king over Egypt. This is probably not just referring to another guy took the throne. This is probably referring to a dynastic change, meaning it's not just the king passing on to his sons anymore, but something has happened in the line of kings, and there's a new dynasty. This happened pretty frequently in Egypt, actually. As I said, we we're talking about the 18th dynasty here, which is quite a lot. And it says he did not know Joseph. This can mean one of two things. Either he was unaware of who Joseph was, or he did not care. And I think both is probably true. And I think even if he did know, he did not care. So which king is this? We've already talked about this some. In 1570 B.C., a man named Amos 
drove out what were called the Hyksos rulers of Egypt. Why is this important? This is one of the reasons I'm inclined to accept an early date, by the way. The Hyksos dynasties were not ethnically Egyptian. They were Semitic people, just like the Jews are Semitic people. They came from the Levant. They came from that area in the Middle East, and they came and conquered Egypt and ruled it for over 100 years. They were a threat in Egypt for more than 200 years, but they actually ruled as the kings and pharaohs for more than 100 years. But then in 1570 BC, this man named Amos rose up and kicked him out. It was a great nationalist victory. Egypt is being ruled by Egyptians again. They used to disparagingly call the Hyksos rulers the shepherd kings. Do you remember from the end of Genesis that shepherds are despised by the people of Egypt? So they got the shepherd kings out, and now we have this man, perhaps Amos, depending on if that's how we're supposed to read this. It doesn't name him, it just calls him Pharaoh. Whether it was that guy, whether it was the next one, Thutmose III, the Hebrews are now targeted. The king was threatened by the immense population group growth of the Israelites. And so he says, we're going to enslave them, lest they someday make war against us. I ought to say, too, where it says they will escape from the land, in verse 10, that word is for escape is the word go up from or go up over the land. So it could be either he's concerned that they're going to leave and they're going to lose all that economic power, or, which I think is also very likely, by go up over the land, he's saying they're going to overwhelm the land. That terminology will be used later in the Old Testament to describe armies overwhelming a city. They went up over the city or over the land. Either way, the point is we've got to do something about these Hebrews. Can you understand if this is the case, as I've laid it out, why Egypt would be prejudiced and fearful of Semitic peoples at this point? I think whether or not it's happening right now, historical memory can last for a long time. So even if you hold to a late date, you're seeing all these Hebrews multiply. Pharaoh can come in and say, remember what happened last time? We had a lot of Semitic people in Egypt. We lost our country. So Pharaoh is going to exploit this prejudice and this cultural fear to enslave the people of Egypt. And you know, many, many cultures have done something like this. The Bible shows us how not to handle what he calls sojourners in the land. What is a sojourner? It is somebody living in the land who does not ethnically belong there, so to speak. Today's example will be what we refer to as illegal aliens. And I have seen folks who ought to know better using the same pharaoh type language to describe that group of people. It's the same language that Hitler used about the Jews in Nazi Germany. Now, there are policy differences that we have with one another. There are things that we believe ought to be done in order to economically or whatever handle a situation. But can I just tell you, Deuteronomy 10:19 says, love the sojourner, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. Amen. So if you're having political discussions about the issue with the border or whatever it is in the South. It used to be the folks coming into Ellis Island. It's nothing new. It was the Chinese coming over in California at one point. You've got to make sure that your discussion is not going into the area of how Pharaoh handled the Israelites. Because these are people and the Lord loves these people. And I try to put myself sometimes in the situation of a father that has nothing going on. And if I knew I could make it here, would I do it? And you might say, well, that doesn't mean that they should just let this happen. Perhaps not. But you've got to guard your own heart and make sure that you personally do not get involved with any kind of hatred or mistreatment of somebody that is a sojourner in our land. Especially the way that these people are oppressed by being paid nothing. Why do we pay them nothing? Because if they ask for more, I can just report them and get them taken out of here. That's wrong. That is wrong to do that. And I'm not going to touch on the political issues here. All I care about the personal issues. We're supposed to love people, especially sojourners. We ought to despise the oppression of foreigners in our own midst, whether that's Islam, whether that's Mexican, whether that's Chinese or Jewish or whatever it is. 
If you want to address the broad issue, address the broad issue, but you stay out of the mud as a Christian. Do you understand? Moving along. So the Israelites are enslaved. They're made to work building cities, making bricks, working the fields. Twice it says, ruthlessly, they treated them. The tables have turned, huh, from when Joseph was ruling the land. God's word is coming true. Maybe they would have wondered, Joseph was, was king, basically, and we've done great. What, what did the Lord mean when he told Abraham that we were going to suffer bondage? That, that could never happen. It happened. There is no guarantee that being God's people will excuse you from suffering or oppression. There are folks that make a lot of money and build big churches by telling people, if you give money to me, if you say a prayer, if you do this, everything's going to be just fine and no problem's ever going to come your way. 1 John 3.13 says, Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. You're signing up to be a Christian. You're signing up to be hated. I talked to the folks that we baptized on Sunday, and I asked them, are you prepared to be a Christian in what are probably going to be the most difficult days America has ever known to be a Christian? And they, of course, all said yes. That's why I baptized them. But we've got to remember that. Christians in communist countries and Muslim countries face horrible persecution every day. It is the lot of the people of God to suffer because the world and the devil despise us. Because by our existence and by our righteousness and by our love for the Lord, we are a reproach to the wickedness of the world. So that's what happened. Let's look at verse 15. This is a fascinating story. I, I was very unprepared for how much fun I was going to have studying this. But verse 15. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua. When you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and let the male children live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they're vigorous, and they give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dwelt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. All right, this is phase two of Pharaoh's plan. Phase one was we're going to work these people to death. Very similar to the concentration camp model or the gulag model, you could say. But it didn't work. They multiplied more and more. So phase two is we're going to kill the babies. He calls these two midwives. Very significant that Pharaoh is not named, but these two midwives are named. Shifra and Pua. Who is Pharaoh? Eh, it doesn't matter. Pharaohs would say things like, my name shall last for a thousand generations. And the Lord's like, not in my Bible, you don't. But he commands them to kill these Hebrew boys as they were born. You might have a note in your Bible, so I want to make sure I address it. Uh, when it says you're sitting on the birth stool, what he's literally saying there is, as you see the stones, this is referring to the sex of the newborn baby. The idea is as that baby is being born, you need to kill it and make it look like it was stillborn. It's a horrific thing that he's asking them to do. But a lot of our English translations give alternate uh, language there because it's, it's a little awkward and uncomfortable to talk about, but... What's the point here? By eliminating the fighting men, Egypt is going to take the daughters for themselves. People say really silly things like, why didn't he kill the daughters? Wouldn't that be more efficient? I'm like, first of all, don't think like that. Second of all, he says, if we get rid of the men, we can take the daughters as ourselves. We can basically rape them, not fit, uh, forcibly, but if there are slaves, we can do what we want with them, and we're going to breed them out. No more Israelites left. Horrible thing here. But these brave women refused to comply because what does it say? They feared God. It's a prime motivation for us. What does it mean to fear God? To fear the judgment of God if you do not do what is right. That is an important motivation to have. On the cross, the thief that was reviling Jesus, the other thief said, Do you not fear God? Are you not a little bit nervous that the last thing you're doing in life is making fun of a righteous man? Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. 
There is a greater king that they are serving. And so Pharaoh calls them back and he demands an explanation. Obviously some time had passed and maybe they did a census or something and like there's still a lot of baby boys around here. And look how sarcastically they, they jab at Pharaoh here. I've seen people that try to take this so seriously. They're trying to defy Pharaoh here. Because well the thing is Pharaoh, you're used to Egyptian women. They're not like our women. Hebrew women are robust and strong and you know, having children is no big deal for them. So they call us. By the time we get there, they're like, oh, baby's already born. I don't need your help anymore. And even that word Hebrew that he's using, I've mentioned this before, is a slur. It's referring to almost as a gypsy, somebody that's got no home. And God blesses these women with dignity, with fertility. And it may have been that women who could not have children became midwives. Some folks have speculated that, which is why the reference to God giving them families is so important. Or it could just be, it's saying just as they brought families into the world, God brought lots more to their family as well. He blessed them for this. Now we're faced with an interesting situation. These women, number one, disobeyed the governing authority, which Romans 13 Verses 1 and 2 tells us we are never to resist because God put it there. And if you resist it, you're resisting God. And number two, they lied about it. Colossians 3 verse 9 says you should never lie. Put away lying. But God blessed them for it. And it, you might have some trouble with this. This is where you have to think biblically and not rigidly. You've got to be able to approach the scripture like Jesus did, not like the Pharisees did. Jesus just had absorbed scripture. I mean, it was his word, right? It makes sense. But he just was able to handle every situation biblically, and he wasn't so concerned about what, where all the lines were, so to speak. This was obviously the right thing to do. I read one commentator that gave this big, long speech about how, you know, they saved the children, but it didn't excuse what they did. I'm like, oh, yes, it did. God blessed them for it. Afraid to say that some, sometimes it's important to lie, I guess. The same people that get bent out of shape when you say, yes, it was the right thing for the Germans to do to hide the Jews in their closet. But you lied and you defied the authority. Listen, when we are compelled to sin by any authority, you have an obligation to say no. It is more binding for us to obey God rather than man. That's what Peter said in Acts 5.29. We told you to stop preaching the gospel. Like, I'm sorry, sir, I can't obey that order. And this lie allowed them to save countless baby boys. Matthew 23, 23, Jesus said, You tithe your mint and your dill and your cumin, but you neglect the weightier matters of the law. Is not saving the life of a baby a weightier matter than telling the king the truth that is going to lead to the death of that same little baby? There are desperate times when you've got to do the right thing and keep to the Holy Spirit of the law. Now, don't use this as an excuse. Oh, the Bible says sometimes you've got to lie. Don't do that. But it's also one of the reasons the New Testament tells us that we are not bound by any law if you are in Christ Jesus. You are led by the Holy Spirit. The main lesson, though, to take from this passage is how to handle oppression and persecution when it comes. It's all fine to talk about grandiose revolution, right? We're going to tear up the street and throw the stones at the police and we're going to take back our country and we don't like that Supreme Court nomination so we're going to break in and change. Let's be realistic. If you really are facing something that is oppressive and awful, what are we supposed to do about it? I love the example of these women. What these midwives show us is that our responsibility in a sinful world is to do what is right in my sphere of influence and leave the rest to God. God has not called you to go and fix it from top to bottom. But God has given you a life with a family and with a, a circle of friends and a job. That is your responsibility. These women were not going to cast down Pharaoh from his throne. They were in charge of delivering babies. And so what they said was, we're going to do this righteously. 1 Timothy 2.2 2 says that we are to pray that we might lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. 1 Thessalonians 4.11 says we ought to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs. The New Testament tells us you don't need to be get wrapped up in all that stuff. And in fact, many people who 
point at the unjust system or the sinful world and they rant and they rave and they put these big long things on the internet, very often their personal life is out of control. So they stop focusing on that and they look to all these other things. And that's cheap and easy. Oh, politicians are corrupt. Okay, yeah. It's cheap to say that. It doesn't solve anything. It doesn't make you a better father. It doesn't make you a better husband. It doesn't make you a good citizen or mother. What is far more difficult, and I might say far more useful, is to tend the patch of garden that God gave you. This is what God has given you. Do that to the best of your ability. These midwives, as I said, could not cast off the yoke of Pharaoh, but they could refuse to kill children. Now you might think, oh, that's so small. My life is so small. My family is so unimportant. My town is so insignificant. It won't make a difference. But listen, God sees. And you know something else? You underestimate your own value. You underestimate the value of what little things can do done rightly, even at the very bottom. We don't have time to turn there, but in Acts chapter 9, we read about Tabitha. Do you remember Tabitha? She sewed clothes and gave them to the widows and to the poor. That was her job. Not an apostle, not a pastor, not a deaconess. She just sewed. Tabitha sewed. She just worked with what she had. And when she died, Peter came up and people were weeping and mourning outside of her house and showing, look at the dress she made me. And Peter goes up and he prays for her and the Lord brings her back from the dead. And there was many people who believed in that city. All Tabitha did was so. She could have looked at her life and say, I can't preach like Peter. I can't walk on water. I can't write scripture. I, I don't know how to do miracles. All I can do is so. So why bother? No, Tabitha sewed. You know what it led to? It led to a lot of people that didn't have clothes being clothed. At her death, it led to a ton of people who were so loved that it broke their heart to see her go. Because Tabitha sowed. Tabitha sowing led to her being raised from the dead. A marvelous miracle done that we're still talking about today because Tabitha sowed. There was a revival in Joppa because of this. There was a revival in her city because Tabitha sowed. There are people that have been saved and inspired to go into ministry and pray for the sick because Tabitha sowed. So don't look at your life and say the little thing that I do doesn't matter. Because you have no idea what your life could be. And God is able to take the little thing that you think is too small to mean anything, that little smooth stone that God gave you, and the Lord is able to bring down Goliath with it. What you do matters. So if you care about the big picture, look to your own life and do that. I want to see this town be saved for Jesus Christ. So what do I do? All I know how to do is so. The Lord comes in and says, just so. Whatever it is that you can do, do it well. Do it righteously. We've got to get rid of these Egyptians. Well, I can't do anything. All I do is deliver babies. But you can refuse the wickedness that you've been asked to do. What you do matters. Esther was brought into the king's house for such a time as this. So who knows about you? Especially as New Testament Christians, we are sojourners. We're living under a hostile regime of sin and the devil. But our mission is the gospel. And you want to know something? We do not need to be free citizens to do the mission of the gospel. The early church was almost entirely composed of slaves. Did you know that? And they turned the world upside down. So I believe the most important thing for any oppressed individual is to work in the sphere that God has given to them and see what blessings might come out of it. All you do is sow, then keep sowing. All you do is sing, then sing. All you do is raise those kids, raise champions in that household. All you do is go work your work-a-day job and then take night shifts sometimes. Pray for those people. Work it well. Set an example for the people around you. You have no idea. Wait upon the Lord because God pulls up and God builds up and God pulls down and God sees you. I love what they teach us here. They weren't able to do anything more than this, but they did all of it. So don't look at your life and compare it to some champion of the faith. You just look at your life and say, what has God called me to do? And do that. And it will be enough. There are going to be heroes and champions of the faith that are going to 
step back and bow in honor to these midwives and we stand in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ. The widow's two mites were worth more than all the treasure that those folks poured into the treasury that day. Well, what are we going to do about this country, man? You live your life well for Jesus Christ. Your community, your neighborhood, your school board, your church. Be like Tabitha and just so, because it's enough. But you've got to be prepared for verse 22. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Pharaoh goes with plan C, kill the newborn baby boys and throw them into the Nile River. This was a perverse way that the Egyptians would show mercy. They believed that the Nile was a god. So they'd say, we'll throw the baby in the Nile, and if the Nile sends them out, then obviously God was pleased with them and they're allowed to live. But if they drown, well, we didn't do it. It was the river's fault, which makes what happens to Moses in the next chapter pretty significant, isn't it? This is what happens. Slowly ratchets up. The Nazis began by removing citizenship from the Jews. Then they had to wear the stars. Then the pogroms came. And then it was the camps. And then it was the mass executions. Unfortunately, it happened in our own countries too when we were slave masters. You look at early on in history, it was not nearly as bad as it became. But as slavery became more and more lucrative and more and more profitable, now we're not going to allow the slaves to read anymore. Now we're not going to allow them to be preached the gospel anymore because they might get some ideas about liberty and freedom. Now we're going to keep the families apart so that they're not getting any ideas about rebelling. It's what happens unless the Lord intervenes. Now, this was probably a short-lived thing. This is not a standing policy that Pharaoh had. For example, Aaron is only three years older than Moses, and he survives. So this was perhaps not such a sweeping command as much as a one-time expedient that Pharaoh went for. But, I mean, the horror of this cannot be overstated. We're going to hit it more next week and talk about it with uh, Moses and his family. But this is going to end up being considered for God the last straw. And so much of the rest of Exodus is going to reference this. The first plague God is going to send upon Egypt is what? The Nile River turned to blood. It had run with blood once before. The last plague is what? The death of the firstborn. The Red Sea is going to drown many of Egypt's sons, just as Israel's had been. And in fact, in the, later on in the book, the Lord himself is going to redeem the firstborn. He's going to say, every firstborn of Israel is mine and committed to my service. This is going to come back a lot. You also can see how Satan is working to destroy the line of the Messiah, as he constantly does. Satan is not dumb. He's still remembering Genesis 3.15, that someday the line of woman is going to crush the head of the serpent. He knows that that line has followed through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now it's in this nation. So we've got to try to wipe it out. Again, even Jesus himself is going to have to escape a similar command. There's another parallel of Christ. Matthew 2.16, when Jesus was born, Herod commanded all the boys two years and younger to be slaughtered. And where did Jesus escape to? Egypt. Again, God's people, even when they do the right thing, are not promised smooth sailing. The midwives saved the children, but many of them ended up being killed by Pharaoh anyway. Does that mean their efforts were useless? What's the point of this just going to happen anyway? Many people that have cooperated with horrible, wicked things have said, well, if it wasn't me, somebody else was going to do it. It doesn't have to be you, though. Now the blood was on Pharaoh's hands, not theirs. If you're going to do the right thing, you've got to be prepared to face the consequences. Daniel chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were commanded to bow down to the golden statue and worship it. And they said, Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. And they said, we're not doing this. God is able to save us, but he might not. We're still not doing it. Now these boys were delivered, but many equally brave men have said no and then been beheaded for it or shot for it or jailed for it or fired for it. 
Oh, the world loves people who take a bold stand against the establishment, right? As long as it's in line with their values, then you're just a rebel and you've got to be cut down. This is why I urge you to engage in small acts of faithful defiance every day. That when evil, wickedness shows its ugly head in your life, that you say no. That Satan, the god of this age, is constantly being told no by you. That the encroaching evil in our nation and in other nations does not find a home in your house. But you've got to be prepared to face that. So that when the moment comes and it's either the furnace or the golden statue, you've already spent a whole life saying no to that, and it's just one more instance of saying no. Can you do what is right before God even if nobody applauds you? Well, Israel has gone from blessed to oppressed, and now they're going to cry out to the Lord, and that's what we're going to see next time. The book of Exodus provides sympathy and hope for those who face similar situations. We ought to be praying for them. There are people around the world that are still facing situations like this. But it's also going to teach us that it's not the political victories that we're supposed to hope for. But we should hope to be bound to the Lord according to his covenant in service to heaven's true king. And also that how we resist evil matters just as much as the resistance itself. Don't sin in fighting sin. And I will say that it is better for you and me to abstain from cheap resistance through barking at people on the internet and waving a bunch of signs. That's so easy. And instead, to look at your domain that God has given you. I deliver babies. I can sow, whatever it is, and say, this domain belongs to Jesus Christ. That's harder. It's less applauded. Nobody's going to celebrate you except for maybe your own wife or husband. But God sees it. And who knows whether he might not grant you a measure of relief in your own neighborhood while the rest of the nation rages. But we've also got to be prepared to suffer in response to doing what is right without being bitter and without hating those who are so lost that they don't know that they're oppressing God's people. God is telling a story through Israel and he wants to tell a story through you. You've got to trust that your life matters, that your actions matter, and that every word and every thought is going to be brought to account before the Lord someday. So even when you are down, you wait upon the Lord because it is the Lord who will lift you up.